Hi everybody, it's Jim from Sprague Wood Turning. This week we're going to make a wedding bowl and as per normal things don't seem to always go to plan but in the end I end up making one of the coolest wedding bowls that I think I've ever made. This week we're going to be making a wedding bowl and what we're going to be using is maple burl. I've already taken the time to cut this to the right size and clean the surfaces up with a wire brush on my lathe. You've seen that a hundred times. So I figured that in an effort to trim these videos that I would just bypass that. So um, this is uh, a commission by Joanna and her daughter is getting married. Her name's Jackie and Alex are getting married and she wants a wedding bowl made for them. Now the colors we're going to use this crystal purple. It's a fan favorite and turquoise blue. All right, so first things first, what I wanna do is measure the volume. Um, this is the, the casting bucket that we're gonna use. Measure the volume so we know how much resin we need to mix up when we come up later on. Calculating volume this way with the rice method is actually really effective. I've done it three times now since the person sent me an email and I'm sorry I lost the email. I really would like to give you credit, but uh, I, I just I can't remember who did it. And uh, so anyway, it's 40% of the volume of the rice and that's just because of the spacing around the rice. Works great. So this is a two liter container. So that is three and a half liters of volume. Now because we're using rice, we need to add 40%. Give me a second. All right, so 3.5 times 40% equals 1.4. We'll call it 1.5 just because of the voids. So, you know, uh, you're looking at five liters of resin. Yikes. Let's hope it doesn't thermal crack on us. I'm hot melt gluing the pieces in place. I don't want any sort of a weight on top of this interfering with the big resin pocket. So that's why I decided to glue them in place and not put a weight on it. Okay, so that's it for now. This is ready to go. Now the math doesn't really work out all that great for five liters of resin. Uh, so I like to mix a liter and a half in each one of these buckets that you have here. So that gives us four and a half liters of resin. I still think that that's gonna be enough because I had quite a thick reservoir on the top of this for it to pull from. So I think it's still gonna be okay. But what the problem is you've got three buckets and so I was just talking to Joanna and what we're going to do is make the crystal purple the dominant color and then we'll use the, uh, the turquoise as the accent color. All right, we'll see you in a little bit and mix the resin at the end of the day. This week we're going to be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. Really can't use anything else here. Uh, this large volume of resin, I was really worried about it cracking. Uh, but I don't want to spoil, but it, you know, it doesn't. <laughs> but uh, when you're when you're mixing that amount of resin in a smaller container, bad things can happen. I've got my thermostat in my clean room set at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you remember the last time we did this, uh, I set it at 60 and it took almost 23 hours before we did the pour. So I'm gonna move it up to 70 degrees. 
I'm going to leave it in these buckets and then this will give lots of opportunity for all the the bubbles to gas off that's not an issue at all and uh, hopefully that pumps up that that time frame better than 23 hours because it took 23 hours last time before we did the pour to get the color separation all right well I will talk to you tomorrow when these are ready to go for some reason the audio wasn't really all that great at this section so I'm just going to do a voiceover on it now you can see I'm putting in a big resin blob so the story behind this is I came out at the 14 hour mark and I looked at the resin and the resin was starting to get thicker for sure but I didn't think it was thick enough. In my clean room there's a grate and the grate wasn't large enough to stick three of those containers across the face of the heater and so one was closer than the other, the other two, and that's why that one looks the way it does. It was closest to the heater. At the 14 hour mark I switched them around. But uh, I was really surprised when I came out at the 16 hour mark and I was like, uh oh, I don't even know if we're going to be able to use this resin. Now, this resin also looks green. Uh, I believe what's happening is the purple is really throwing off the camera settings, but it is 100% blue. So, you know, I was really worried with that thick epoxy being as thick as it was if, if we were going to be able to do this, but it did work, but I almost gave up on it at that point. Glad I didn't. So once I had mixed the two of them together, uh, I put it in the pressure pot for 72 hours and hoped for the best. <sighs> well, it is 72 hours later and uh, I don't see any thermal cracking. This is good. I guess that little resin blob still floated. I guess it just had more air in it than the rest of the resin. <laughs> uh, so anyway, let's uh, get this out and see what we're looking at. This is going to be a problem. I guess I better grind this down or else I'm going to have a hard time getting this out. Get a bigger drill bit and drill it a little larger. Well, it's not stuck on the bottom. Yeah, it's moving. I don't know if the tape is holding it on the bottom, but it's free. I don't know why that air pressure won't push that out of there. <laughs> uh. would not release. Anyway, it's out. Yeah, lots of nice color separation. Exactly what we want it. No thermal cracking. Take note of that. Got a good, solid, awesome piece. With a nice purple river running through it. Very cool. All right, let's, uh, well, we got a center here.
So my neighbor up the road uh, was here this morning. He goes, you know, I'm kind of curious about the weight of this thing. And I said, yeah, you know, I should probably try and uh, keep that a standard thing in my videos. So anyway, I got up my weigh scales. And this blank sits at 17 pounds, 15 ounces. That's what that uh, blank weighs before we uh, reduce its weight. Just in case you're curious. I will try to keep that as a standard in my videos. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize the weight of these things when they first come out of the pressure pot. Now this one of course is a fairly large blank. I believe it started at 5 inches is what I believe the depth of this is. So that is over the uh, recommended pour, the manufacturer's recommended pour. Uh, but you know what, I'm really finding that you can really tailor how fast you want this resin to cure by temperature. So, you know, I'll, I'll do an experiment next time that I'll, bu I'll bump it up to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And from there, we'll see if we hit that, you know, the 14 hour or 12 or whatever it is you're, you're shooting for. I, I don't want to come out in the morning. I don't want to have to go out say at midnight and mix up the resin so that it's ready to go at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, I would prefer not to do it that way. If I can do the 14 hours, then I think that's will work out best for me as far as mixing time is concerned and then getting out to the workshop to, uh, to get it, you know, poured. But in the end, I've got perfect color separation. I couldn't probably ask for any better than what I got this week. And I was really, really, really concerned that that big resin blob was going to be an issue that was going to be full of air. And it isn't. It actually, you wouldn't even know it was in there. I did cut through it with the stick so that that, um, so the blue could kind of flow through it. But uh, it actually worked out better than, than I really thought it was going to. And, you know, uh, I cut out the section where I was talking to the camera because the audio was screwed up. And I really was, yeah, thumbs up there. I was really tempted to go, okay, like, we're going to just going to have to throw this away and basically re-mix uh, more resin. But I'm like, there's five liters of resin. I just can't do it. So I decided, hey, we're going to we're going to go for it and uh, let's see what happens. And like I said, I'm glad I did because it actually worked out perfectly. So I'm just shaping the outside here, getting rid of any excess resin. And of course, we're using the Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. This is the larger 5 8 number three. Actually, the color separation in this is probably the best that I've been able to achieve so far which is kind of ironic because I almost bailed on it <laughs> so you know it's I've got more burl the way I looked at it was if this didn't work then I've got more burl and you know either way I, I probably would have been able to do something with this blank so that's kind of why I risked it because I knew that if it didn't work out I could make another one I, did, I also want to mention that we are going to put a ring in the very top of this. And what I mean by a ring is they're using white gold as uh, wedding rings. So white gold is essentially looks like chrome. So that's very hard to make. So it'd be interesting to see what your thoughts are on that. But right now we're just going to whittle this down and then we'll tackle that a little later on. Well, there's the color separation that we definitely want. A couple little bubbles in there. Nothing real big to worry about at all. There is some green here that I'm going to harden up with the thin CA. Uh, this is probably about an inch into the casting. So that resin being as thick as it was, it just couldn't get there in time. But that's not a big deal. Because we'll just use the thin Star bond, seal this up and I'll trim it again and then we'll see where we're at. 
If you're keeping track or keeping score at home, this is actually the third time that I've used this method. And it's only got one drawback. I suppose my hand's right in the way in it. And the only drawback that I can see to waiting as long as you do before combining these pieces, or sorry, combining the resin with, with the castings, is that it doesn't give the deep cast a very long time to wick into those little areas. Because, of course, it's it's much thicker than it ordinarily is. If this casting is submerged in deep cast and then put into the pressure pot right away, I can pretty much guarantee you that all these little cracks and voids are going to be filled. But, you know, when you're when you're shooting for a casting like this, it's just one of the things you're going to have to deal with. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the outside of that casting was completely covered in glue. So there, except for the resin parts, I think in total to make this bowl, I used probably three ounces of thin CA from Starbond. So, you know, it, it, uh, it was thirsty, but you know what? Like I said earlier, it's a beauty. Another thing that I'll be changing when I do these castings like this where I'm looking for this color separation with a deep cast is I'm not going to put such a large reservoir on the top. The reason for that is it, the, the wood itself doesn't have enough time to absorb all that resin so it's just being wasted. So that's another consideration. I will leave a reservoir on there but it won't be as deep as it usually is. And this here will give you an idea what most wood turners that turn resin see when they're turning. <laughs> it's once you get down into the uh, the wood and the resin, it doesn't do that. But when you're just turning straight resin, it comes off in long ribbons like that, and it wraps around everything and can be quite irritating, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> so once you get uh, past that, uh, it's certainly a lot nicer to uh, to turn. So we're just getting rid of all the excess resin because we still plan on coring this piece. And, you know, I, I just want to, I'm actually making a tenon on the very top so that I can reverse this and get the bottom flattened before we put a glue block on it. If you're curious what I'm doing there. Still too large. That's a go, no go gauge that I've got for my stronghold chucks. Just a quick and easy reference, just so you know. I didn't really need a really large solid tenon here because I wasn't, I was mainly using this just so that the glue block was centered properly. Just clean up with the parting tool. Resin tendons are harder than wood tendons, so it's really hard to get a bite on it. So you'll see me use a little cheater tube right there to torque this down to make sure that it's uh, held firmly. And there's the hole in the bottom of this from when I initially drilled the hole in the bottom to blow air in, if you're curious why that's there. Uh, the great thing about those is the fact that, you know, you can put them on the pin on your live center or your drive center. And that way one hand is freed up to work the tailstock when you're putting it between centers. And there's the hot melt glue and that is a hard maple waste block. I keep getting asked what I do with the shavings and I have been saving them as long as there's no wood chips in them. I've seen examples on YouTube where they recycle these wood, uh, these shavings, and there's little bits of wood in it. And to me, it just looks really dirty. So, you know, I've got this one that's got the purple and the blue in it. And then I've got one that's green. And I think maybe i got one that's black. So, you know, eventually we're going to do something with these. Um, just not exactly sure what it's going to be just yet. But I am saving them. 
Now that the glue is cured, we'll be able to whittle this down. You'll see me use the go no go gauge again. So when I'm cutting tenons that's going to be held, and this, this will probably go for any chuck. If you cut your tenon as large as possible, that in reality gives you the least clamping pressure uh, that you can get from a tenon. I like to have it about halfway between fully open and fully closed. I think that probably the greatest clamping pressure that you're going to get is when it's almost to its smallest opening. But for a blank this size, I wasn't real comfortable having a tenon that small because I probably could have took another quarter of an inch off the size of that tenon that you see there now. But for me, it was just a little too small. So before we reverse this to get some coring done, I just want to trim this up again so it's running relatively true before uh, we start coring. We are all set up and ready for coring. This is the one-way coring rig. If you haven't seen this before, there's different size knife sets and you can get multiple bowls out of one casting like this. This is the number two knife set. I've got my Core Pro cutter in from Hunter Tools. It should eat this up really good. We're not going to be able to get any tailstock support until I can get the rig in a little ways here. That's about what we're looking at for that. But once we get in a little ways, I'll be able to get some tailstock support and have, hopefully everything is okay until then. One thing that you can do is set up your steady rest. And if you have a project on the lathe that's got kind of like a tulip um, look to it, then of course, if you put the, the wheels running on the smaller part of the tulip, then really it's pretty impossible for it to come out. So there, there are certainly ways around it. Uh, ideally, once you get that tailstock support in there, that's really going to really be beneficial to you. So uh, certainly use it if you have uh, the ability to do so. One of the things with this these burl and resin castings, they can be quite grabby. And so that's, and I find I'm getting into the danger area right there. That I find when I've had pieces come out, ripped out of the chuck is usually in that area there. It's usually not when I'm all the way out near the rim or all the way near the base. Slow and steady wins the race. I wasn't able to fully extract the tool, so I just kept using compressed air to blow the chips out, and eventually we get it. So you can see down inside of the casting that there's still going to be lots more areas to fill in the future when we use this piece. Now we're mounted outboard. Uh, you can kind of see that there's more <laughs> glue on the outside of this again. So I gave it another filling of glue on the outside. So we're just trimming it up before I, I threw up the top. I noticed that, you know, one of the drawbacks about using this hot melt glue is it does get transferred to your tools and then if you're using a CBN wheel to sharpen it will get transferred to that. Isopropyl alcohol is an easy way to clean off your CBN wheels. Just dump it on it and scrub it with a brass brush and it'll clean up but that hot melt glue does tend to get on everything and there was a little spot on my tool rest so I just used a razor blade to clean it all off and then I didn't have any issues with 
the tool gliding on the surface of that too. That is, that tool rust is from Robust and that is a hardened steel rod that you see on the top. Highly, highly recommend Robust do, uh, tool rusts. I've got two of them now, maybe three, and they are fantastic. What can happen if you're an impatient uh, bolt turner like I am sometimes is when you get down to the very base of the of the bowl, the very dead center of the bowl, if you're kind of in a hurry and you push past it, what will happen is since the wood is spinning to the right, it'll grab the tool and it doesn't matter what tool, any tool that you're using, it'll pick it up and slam it down on the tool rest. And I know that I'm not alone. <laughs> I know that there's a bunch of you out there that this has happened to. So, you know, it, it, it pays to slow down and, and take your time when you're doing this stuff. But if you're, if, but with this lathe, with its cast iron tool rest, the, the tool rest that came with this lathe, if that happens, it usually will leave a dent in the top of the tool rest. And then, of course, when you're trying to push the tool across the tool rest, you're hitting all these little dips and, and valleys and bumps and lumps. So, you know, then you got to take a file out, file it down, and so on and so on and so on. So do yourself a favor if you're looking to upgrade your your lathe to a really I'm not gonna say it's inexpensive, but you know, as far as lathe tools are concerned, it's not too bad. Get yourself a robust tool rust. And uh, I'm kind of curious if anybody's got a robust lathe. I hear they make fantastic lathes. Kind of curious about your take on that as well. We've still got a fair bit of thickness to go here, but I figure that I better harden up these areas because the, um, the resin just didn't have time to penetrate into those areas. So, you know, there's a few little voids here that I'm just going to fill in with the clear CA. Uh, this green here is a little punky, so I'll harden that up as well with the CA glue, the thin CA glue from Starbon. Along with filling in cracks, of course, the thin CA glue can be used to harden up the grain as well. That kind of yellowy area was really kind of punky. Well, not really punky, but it was certainly a little softer than the surrounding grain. So that's another thing that I will do with the thin CA glue. Harden up those areas. That way it sands up nicely. There, that's filled in. Uh, we'll probably have to do that another two or three more times for it to harden up that grain. Anyway, I'll let that sit for a little bit and we'll trim it back and see what we're looking at. So with there being a really heavy resin pocket on one side and then of course burl on the other, I wasn't able to get this piece up over 300 RPM. Yeah, anything above that, the uh, the lathe was vibrating quite, quite violently. Well, not violently, but it was shaking bad enough that I knew that it was going to affect the cut. So I had to keep it around the 300 mark in order to uh, get this piece trimmed out. So we're still going to do an inlay in the rim on this. So that's why it's thicker than it usually is. I do like hefty pieces. So this is certainly up my alley. But, you know, after this gets sanded and trimmed up a little more, then, you know, you've got to leave enough room for what's going to be the 
white gold wedding ring that I'm planning on putting in the very top of this. That was another filling of CA. I don't know if you noticed the, the color of the bowl. I did it on the outside and on the inside again. One way around this would be to cast this again in clear, uh, clear resin. You'd probably would have to use the deep cast because if you use dark cast, I don't know if that's going to give you enough time to for it to penetrate into all of these areas. And trust me, there was probably a thousand cracks in this burl. So, you know, I did my best to fill them all. Uh, but, you know, you're not going to always get them all. Pieces like this, while the food, they are food safe. I mean, I would probably just stick this out for dis display. It would be an absolute shame to see this get scratched up with, you know, utensils or <laughs> or whatever. Uh, typically, resin bowls are mostly used for display, but the resin itself is food safe from designer epoxy, and the finishes that I typically use are food safe as well. So it certainly can be used for function, but I think most people just leave them out for display. So the base on this piece is still quite thick compared to the rim. So all I'm doing is whittling this down. You'll see me uh, measure this here shortly. And it won't be too long before we move on to sanding. Speaking of sanding, these are the three and a half inch dimple discs from sandpaper.ca. There is a link in the description to get 10% off your next order. That goes for designer epoxy, hunter tools, and Starbond adhesives. All of your discount codes are in the description down below. So if you need some stuff, head on down there and use my code inlaygem to put some money back in your pocket. Like I do each week, I start at 60 grit and on pieces like this I'll tip, typically start at 60 grit go to 180 then there'll be some sanding dust left over like you'll see right there in the bowl and I rub that all into the surface of the bowl and then I'll hit that with the thin stir upon again and then continue sanding from 180 to 800. Once that's done we're going to buff this piece out with the triple E buffing compound from the be all buffing system and for the new people all this does is remove any fine scratches before we get our first coat of finish on but in this case we're going to cut a groove for the area where I want to do some some inlay with some resin some more resin and don't forget that denatured alcohol here I'm using the parting tool from crown just going to cut in an area where we can mix up some resin that looks kind of chrome-ish, white gold-ish, if you will. It's not an easy color to achieve. I actually mixed up a few samples of this and the one that I mix up seems to be the best that I've been able to achieve. By all means, if you do do a chrome kind of resin, I would really be interested in finding out how you actually achieve the chrome look or the silver look. And there's some beautiful resin. All right, finally to the first coat of finish, we're going to use Waterlux Gloss. I'm under kind of a time constraint here, so I'm going to put the finish on. I'm going to keep it off the very top and we'll put that we'll put this in the pressure pot and then we'll mix up some resin and pour it in the rim that sure is some pretty resin 
beautiful color separation. Beautiful burl. Oops. Try not to bump that. That's a real cool section right there too. With the resin. Really, really nice. And the burl ain't bad either. All right, let's mix up some resin. So I thought the camera was on when I was mixing this art cast. There's four ounces of it, which should be plenty. And to achieve this color, um, the rings are white gold. And white gold is almost looks like chrome, if you will. And this is about as close as I can get to it. And what I did was take one quarter teaspoon of the satin white, or satin white gray, and then a half a teaspoon of the crystal ice white, and that's where the shimmer comes from. I figured it'd be a lot easier to uh, put it in if I put it in a syringe. So that's what this is. There. And f so everybody knows I did level this before it went in. All right, I'm going to get the top on this and we'll see you tomorrow to cut this back and then get our second coat on. All right, so it is the next day and I find this a little interesting in development. Uh, when it was in the pressure pot last night, the finish didn't cure. I would say that it's maybe at 50% on the resin. It's really sticky. Uh, the wood, not so bad. Uh, yeah, I just never thought that that was going to be a thing but I guess it is <laughs> so anyway what I'll do is cut this back and sand it and then I guess I'll try and strip off the previous coat and uh, we'll get our second coat on so look at all that valuable information you get from my channel don't try and cure your finishes inside the pressure pot even though, you know, once the air goes in, it's actually a very sterile environment. Probably be an ideal place to cure finishes. Maybe we should try them in a vacuum next time. Uh, you know, it never even dawned on me, but yeah, I, I suppose that there's no atmosphere really for, for it to cure the finish. So yeah, of course it's going to be an issue. So it was... Uh, the inlay area of the silver slash chrome resin was sanded to 800 as well and then buffed. And then what I did to get rid of that sticky finish was to use, just use the triple E buffing compound. And surprisingly, it worked actually very well to remove any of the stickiness from the finish before the next coat. All right, this is the second coat of Waterlux Gloss. Not 100% happy with the ring. Would have liked to have seen it more sparkly, uh, more silvery or chromish. But, you know, overall, I'm okay with it. I just wish it was a little bit more blingy, that's all, because you know, I like the bling, you know. <laughs> all right, I will do the third coat the same way. I expect it's going to need another one, and then we'll see you when we're doing the bottom. It did in fact take three coats. So when that was done, mounted it on the vacuum chuck. And here I'm just using the bowl gouge from David Ellsworth, the 5 8 bowl gouge to take down the remainder of the waste block. And then you'll see me switch to the Hercules. Actually, you'll see me use both Hercules here. 
Now, of course, I knew that there was that little hole in the base, so I knew that there was going to be a mortise in the bottom of this. Uh, you can, <laughs> if you don't account for this, then you could turn your bowl into a funnel. So that was always in the back of my mind uh, when I was actually doing this. But I knew that I had lots of thickness on the very bottom here, and I knew that there wasn't going to be an issue. Once I had the base all trimmed up, I sanded it from 60 to 500. I didn't want to go above that. I find anything above that is it's kind of hard to write on. And I do like writing on the bottoms of these bowls to give it that personal touch. And I actually included that this week. So here I'm just putting the details on the bowl as to what it is, my name, the number in Canada. Of course, like put Canada on the bottom. This is a wedding bowl, so I typically put down their two first names and then the date that they're married. And then you'll see my mechanic skills come in here in a second when I use a socket to draw two interlocking rings. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. It was a little longer than I than I had hoped it would be. Let's finish this up. Well, all right, that's it for the video. Check out this beauty. Awesome color separation from the deep cast. Couldn't be any more pleased with that than I am, that's for sure. Burl is awesome as well, really, really busy. That area in the resin, I think, is actually some of the coolest. Nice blend in that little, that little C that's right there. Very, very pretty bowl. And as far as the wedding ring is concerned, there, that's probably the best that we're gonna get as far as looking at it is concerned. Maybe a little bit more of the ice white and less of the gray, and that would have uh, maybe popped a little more to, to look more like white gold. And uh, of course, here is the bottom. No finish as of yet because it's Thursday and I'm um, got to get this uploaded. But congratulations to Jackie and Alex. And if you're curious, this is 10 and a quarter inches across and four and a quarter inches tall. And it's a beauty. Let's set this down. So you may notice that there is a power cap air, air, um, air respirator. So I got that in yesterday and um, I'm I need to use it for a couple of weeks so that before I can really talk about it, I'm looking for a replacement for my my Trend Air Pro Shield. Um, just I don't know. I'm just tired of spending money on batteries every year. It's crazy. So and there's there's other issues with it as well. But anyway, I'll wear it for a couple of weeks and then I'll give a fair evaluation on what I think of it. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by. I don't know what YouTube is doing. It's it's. <laughs> I've, people are telling me that they've been unsubscribed to my channel and the bell notifications been taken off uh, views are way down on my on my account I think that you know it's it's springtime and people are busy you know cleaning up your yards and that kind of stuff so YouTube's probably taking a back burner to that but just really odd the way it's gone so I don't know every now and then YouTube seems to do weird and wacky things like this but I don't know why Anyway, if you haven't seen my videos, that might be why when you're, when you're seeing this. Uh, don't forget to put designer epoxy in the comments down below to be entered into the giveaway, the three gallon giveaway kit at 100,000 if we ever get there. <laughs> we're, we're stuck at 93,500. And of course, I'll be giving away something at 95,000. So please leave a comment down below for that. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing a turntable cover for those bourbon guys. So um, it should be interesting and something we haven't done before. So please come on back for that. All right, well, that's it. Take care, stay safe. Don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. That is the best way for me to build my, my account here on YouTube. I would really appreciate it. All right, see you next week.